thanks guys for um so i have two screens and over here i have um the participant list and um the chat box so um i will try and monitor both of those as well yeah so um it was interesting giving kind of my first zoom lecture uh yesterday i gave a two-hour lecture in the mixed reality course and uh hope it went okay um and um it's always weird not having an audience so i actually like having the list of participants up because then you can at least there's a text audience uh, so okay so um uh what i'm going to talk about today so so i realized that um well I'll just start this way i guess so as a quick note in in previous lives that i have um Again, these these times of uh, of being at home a lot has, makes you think a lot. So, if I think back, um, I used to be a really good programmer. I know this sounds really arrogant, but I was a really good programmer. I really liked programming. I had really good foundations. And then when I moved to Germany, I worked for six years at a company, and I was lucky enough to be put in the in the room. So we made real time factory automation software. So something completely different, but. Um, so we would go into factories and look at the process that they're, whether they're brewing beer or making chocolate or whatever, and we would put in sensors and we wrote some real-time software to track what's going on with the manufacturing process. Completely different than what I'm doing now. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, I was 22 years old, moved to Germany, started working at a company, and, um, you know, at that time, 22 was pretty young. And they put me in the office and I shared an office with this guy called Peter Fries. And Mr. Fries, we called him, of course, because you'd have to call somebody with the last name Fries, uh, Mr. Fries. And um, he was like the play, the person that everybody at the company went to whenever they had a programming question. And so I sat in the office, <clears throat> sorry, across from Peter. And, and every time someone come in and ask a question, I'd listen to the answer. And so I learned so much from watching this really, really great programmer. Um, and um, I just grew so much as a, um, as, a, um, as a programmer, as a computer scientist, based on a strong foundation at uni and then, and then kind of jumping into this job. Um, and that's kind of, you know, helped me with my PhD later. So after Germany, I moved um, after six years in Germany working there, I moved back to the States and started my PhD in VR and started graphics from, from really nothing. Um, and um, I also started teaching. So when I, was at, um, when I was in Germany, I started teaching a little bit. And then when I started doing a PhD, after like three years, they, handed, they said, we'd like you to be the course coordinator for this operating systems course, because I really loved operating systems. Um, and so I, and I had a lot of really good uh, mentors to learn from in, in, in order to teach. Um, and so I really, really, really love teaching. And um, you know, teaching last night was, was just, a, was really fun. Um, and now my job in this life, so fast forward another life, um, I don't teach very much. So any chance I get, and I don't program very much and I really want to get back into programming. That's another story. Um, uh, and, so I like giving lectures like this because I have all of this material that I've um, that I've collected over the years and, and given several times. So anyway, it's a little bit of a background. I have to say that um, for me, um, as a as a programmer, there are some fundamental courses that I think are taught and used to be taught and um, are still taught in different ways. But for me, that kind of the the four courses that I really really learned about programming and, and, and things um, are kind of a CS2 course or, or a data structures course, which really teaches you how to efficiently represent data in, in many, many different ways. And then algorithms, which, which shows you how to then walk through those data structures that you've created and efficiently process the data. And, and, and again, efficiency is really, really important in each of these. And um, um, I think in, in more recent languages like Java and, um, and, and uh, other object-oriented languages, we just don't think about efficiency as much as we used to in terms of um, the data and, and algorithms. Um, 
Um, and then operating systems is really important because it teaches you, you know, how the stuff that we do at a high level interacts with the hardware at a lower level. Um, and to understand that the choices you make at a high level are going, that you can make choices at a higher level that make things more efficient at a lower level. And finally, compilers were just kind of this connection between what you write at the high level and what's executed at the low level. And once you have actually had to go, go through and take high level statements and, and kind of reproduce them at a very low level, it's really hard. Um, I mean, it, it's a huge benefit to understand how you can better program at a higher level based on what's happening. So that's that's just a little bit of a soapboxy thing um, that I think um, hopefully is still being done throughout the curriculum for people that want to become really strong um, um, in uh, the technical side of things. Now, the, the the nice thing is now we have game engines. So we a lot of these types of things are not really things that people think about a lot because the game engines have their own frameworks and ways of doing things. So it's some, and in, in, in some senses, we're we're happy now because we don't have to worry about all these messy bits underneath. We can just use the structures that are given to us and the algorithms will be run for us and, and they'll be compiled for us. And so, and, and these game engines are actually operating systems because they're managing all the resources, which is what operating systems do. So there's all these abstractions now that it's great because we don't have to deal with this, but, um, but I'll argue that I think um, they're still very, very important. So uh, I hope that's, um, hope that comes across okay. Um, and again, I'm not pining for the past, okay? I'm not, I understand we've moved on and there's so many things that are so much easier now. Um, it's just, I think that we need to, to make sure that um, um, we still pay attention to some of the things. And, and, um, and so that's, that's kind of um, led me to, um, to kind of give this talk. Move this out of the way a little bit. Okay, is everything okay? Everything's running fine in terms of the presentation, I hope. Um, you can use the yes button if you want or the, or the no button or, the, or whatever. Um, so the, the, the main problem I want to address uh, that we address with these, um, these types of uh, scene management is that users are always wanting more. So, so games come out and they want better graphics. They want the behaviors of, of entities need to be more realistic. Um, we want really incredible lighting effects that come up lots of interactivity. We want lots of characters on screen. We want lots of people being able to jump on um, and, and interact with each other. Um, and the hardware is always getting better. So, you know, the, the new graphics cards come out, the processors get faster. And it's, it's always getting better and better, but it's never quite fast enough, right? So everybody has to upgrade because the, the content designers push things further. So if, you, if we think about this another way, the hardware is always going to lag behind the needs or the desire. So you could think about it this way is that once you're, once something becomes really easy to do, the designers are going to push it even further. So these needs are always going to expand to fill whatever performance vacuums you give somebody more processing power, or more memory, they're just going to fill it up. Um, so, <clears throat> which is fine. Um, and it, it keeps us all employed and, and keeps interesting problems popping up, which is really good. So um, in order to support this in the games context or in a VR context, we can think about things that we really need to manage objects, network connections, um, characters. We need to manage everything on screen really efficiently. So calculating what's visible. So if you think I'm standing, if you think about somebody standing in a big 3D world, all the stuff that's behind me is if this is single player, I don't need to draw that stuff. So even though it's there, I can turn and look at it. But once I look at it, I need to draw it. So, you know, in, in a very simple sense, I just want to be able to kind of figure out what's in my view and then draw only that stuff. In addition, things that are really, really far away from me, I don't need to draw with high level of detail because they're only like one pixel in size. So I don't need to spend a lot of processing to do that. So these are just kind of two examples of, of, of ways that I could manage my scene. If I could just figure out what's visible, if there's a wall in place, there's a whole bunch of stuff behind the wall, but I don't care about that stuff. The system needs to know what's visible and what's not visible. It's a very simple problem. 
but is used in a lot of ways. So it's not just what's visible, but also what could I shoot? Or if I turn on a light, where should the light shine? Uh, all of these things are using really the different variations of the same problems. And so what we've done is come up with ways to, to fake it. So a lot of lighting calculation is done in a pre-computing phase. So we, we, we bake in um, mappings and then just apply those. Um, and so there's lots and lots of kind of mappings and, and tricks that have been done. Um, uh, and, and all those have been done really to really address this problem of we want more, but we don't have a bigger computational budget. So the bottom line is these graphics cards get faster, but they're never really going to be as fast as we'd like. So we can, we can keep, we will keep making better hardware and, and that they'll be really, really, really good at processing things. But in the end, it would be really good if even before we get to the graphics card that we can manage the scene better so we can squeeze more out of them. So if you think about it, the hardware is always going to get faster, but if I want to run it on my phone, I, I can't because I don't have a GPU on my phone or I want to run on some other headset like, like the Quest, I, I can't because it just doesn't have the processing. But if I could pre-compute without using GPU some visibility calculations, then I could run things on, on these kind of lower end devices. So, um, so the nice thing is that I can, I can, these are under my control and I'm not beholden to the graphics card being upgraded or, or whatever. I can do this on the CPU. I can do it on the GPU as well, but I could do it on the CPU because these have been around pre-GPU. So, so it's simple ways or, or ways that have been done to, to think about this um, are things called scene graphs, which are hierarchical representations of things in the scene. So for example, th I'm in a room right now even though it looks like I'm in space. I'm in a room right now, there's another room out there. I can logically say that this room has a whole bunch of objects in it and that room has a whole bunch of objects in it. And the objects in this room are children of this room and all the objects in that room are children of that room. So the bookshelf in there and the, the carpet and, and whatever. Um, I can come up with a hierarchy of, and the bookshelf has Lego minifigures on it or books on it. And those are children of the bookshelf. The bookshelf is child of the room. So I can, I can lay out this scene graph that really describes the location, the spatial relationship between objects in a hierarchical way. And this is very powerful. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, more. Everybody okay? I know you can't put your thumbs up, I guess, but there's no thumb up icon, is there? Anyway. Um, I'll just keep talking unless somebody starts yelling at me in the, in the group chat. So here's an example. So um, this is a, a, you know, not a very popular game, but a game that um, some of you might have heard of. Um, you, so here's like one scene and you have a lot of stuff going on here. So um, you can see my mouse. So you have this building over here with a hole in it and some, um, some pipes coming out of it. And then you have way in the background, you have um, a building, you have these balconies with some um, air conditioning units, you have like uh, graffiti, you have these two people, you have this um, entryway over here, you have all of this uh, very complex geometry going on. And somebody's gone to a lot of trouble to draw this really, really well. And the question is, um, how do I efficiently figure out what I can see? So there's stuff for, ex for instance, this building is blocking a lot of the content of the building behind it. This guy is in front of the, a lot of the content of this building. How can I figure out what I need to draw, what I don't need to draw, what I need to process, and so on? And, um, and this is just one environment. Or what if I shoot, if I had a weapon and I wanted to shoot something or I wanted to throw something, how do I figure out what that thing hits? Um, I need to have some way of very efficiently understanding this. And if you multiply this times thousands of people and thousands of objects, it gets very messy very quickly. So um, as another example, again, this is from Alex. Um, I don't know what that thing is on the guy's head, but it doesn't look really attractive. I'm sure Ryan will let us know what that is. Um, but if you think about this scene, so it seems very normal. I mean, it's, well, normal. <laughs> in the gaming sense, I guess. Um, it's definitely in Russian. There's Russian on the poster over there. Um, think about this chain link fence. So if I were going to um, build this scene, I would probably 
um, come up with um, a modeling tool that allowed me to make each link of this fence. Um, and, um, and then I would put the fence there because that's the way fences work. Um, and the nice thing about that is if you, if you see the fence on the right, on the left, you can see the reflection or the lighting coming through is affected by this fence. So you have lights over here, they're shining through this fence onto this wall and you see you have this nice pattern that says, oh look, there's a light shining through the fence and I can see realistically what it would look like. That calculation is very, very expensive to do from a processing point of view. And so what you, what's probably going on is there actually is no geometry over here. There are actually no, um, there might be, um, but there, it would take somebody a long time to model each one of these. And it would also be really expensive from a processing point of view of each one of these with some piece of geometry. So probably there's some faking going on here, uh, but, but you can see that, again, this is a very simple scene. It's just an indoor scene with, um, with lighting and things. But to represent this, you have reflections down here as well. This, you know, all of these effects cost a lot in terms of uh, processing power and representation. So, um, uh, and, and again, this is probably the bleeding edge right now. Plus there's all this stuff behind me. There's all this stuff that, that is around the corner that I can't see right now. And, and so, so, uh, so I guess I, I've belabored that point enough, but there's, it's really tough to represent these things efficiently. So scene graphs um, are um, a specification of, of relationships between objects. Team drink. Um, paint a picture of the fence with a normal map, specular map, a transparent map, map it on a plane. Place low red cylinders for the bars. Yep, you got it. Okay, so, so Andy has solved our problem, so that's great. Um, uh, so if we think about uh, these scene graphs, uh, when someone is putting together a scene, they, um, uh, like a, um, a content, somebody making content is putting together a scene, they do typically think about them in spatial terms. And so you'd have objects that are described um, in relation to other objects. So for example, um, if you have, if I have my hand and I put a pen on my hand, the pen is probably defined in relation to my hand so that when I move my hand, the pen moves. And these kind of hierarchical transformations and things in computer graphics are, are, are kind of a key cornerstone to, um, to these types of representations. There are also material properties. So one um, bookcase might have um, a wood texture or wood materials applied to it. And I can apply, um, I can have a node in my scene graph that says wood and then anything defined under that node would inherit from the parent that, oh, wood, 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 wood. Or I could have something underneath that says wood, 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 but oh, wait, there's some metal legs on it. So I might have a scene graph that has a wood material and a bunch of um, sides and bottom and things like that. And then I have another material node here that it's metal. And then I have a bunch of legs defined. So this is kind of a graph structure. It is a graph structure. And there are transformations in geometry and materials and other things that are inside this graph that give me a really nice, elegant data structure for representing this, um, this scene. And then it's easy. The other thing about this graph is since things are hierarchical, if I want to move the pen from my hand to a desk, um, and the, again, the pen is its own hierarchical data or hierarchical scene graph that has like a white part and a black part and, and other things. Um, I can then, and from a graph point of view, take the pen sub scene graph and make it remove it as a child from my hand and make it a child of the desk by changing some things. And then everything else comes along with it, the white part and the black part and everything. So again, I'm waving my hands a little bit because I don't want to go too deeply into this stuff. And, and I'm assuming that some people understand from working with game engines what these scene graphs, but scene graphs are, are extremely powerful um, in many ways. Um, yeah, I will skip this a bit. Um, so part of the, the keys to looking at kind of scene management is really around, um, uh, it's, there's multiple things that we have to do or things that we can do. Um, there isn't one particular solution. So one of them, for example, is we want to only render what we can see. We only draw what we can see. So we need to figure out what can I see? And then once we figure out, once we've reduced the the whole set of the infinite number of things that I could see, 
and I've, I have now have a smaller number, then I, I want to only render at a level of fidelity or level of realism that like the, 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 the minimum number to make a uh, minimum level of fidelity to make it look realistic. So if it's really far away, I don't need to render it in, in all its uh, glory. If it's really close to me or it's really important, I might want to render at a higher, uh, higher fidelity. If it's more, cl if it's closer to the center of the screen than the, so there's different ways to think about this. Um, the other thing is we want to pre-process as much as possible. So if, uh, if we know that the scene is static, um, then I can go through and I can do some very detailed um, uh, uh, pre-processing of the scene and produce some data structures that will allow me to use algorithms to, um, to figure out, um, uh, to help me in this visibility calculation. And we'll talk about this in a bit. So this is, we really want to pre-process as much as possible. So this baked in lighting, for example, is, um, is, is part of this. And then again, we want to use the graphics unit um, as efficiently as we can. So we want to send things down the graphic, the graphics pipeline in the right order and, um, and so on to really keep it, um, keep it busy as much as possible. So the first level here is something that's called view frustum culling. So view frustum culling says, here's my view frustum. So you could think of this as a pyramid coming, going out from my eyes. So I had this pyramid and, and I want to figure out what's inside this view frustum and what's outside of it. And everything outside, I can not deal with at all or deal with in a different way. Then back face culling says, okay, even if I have an object, let's say I have, um, I have an object in my scene, this, this hard drive. Um, the hard drive is a cube um, and there are parts of it that you can see and parts of it that you can't see. The parts that you can't see are facing away from you and that's what's called back facing. So things that are facing away from you, we're not going to draw or we're not going to look at. So we figure out which objects are in the scene and then we figure out which objects, uh, which parts of the object are actually facing away from you. And I don't need to even draw those because um, there's, there is stuff back here, but you're never going to see it unless I turn it around. And so I, I do that dynamically. So anything facing away, I'm just not going to draw. So what I'm doing is I'm reducing all the stuff that I have to send uh, to the graphics pipeline. Another thing is um, bounding volumes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So what I want to do is once I, once I have these, this set of objects, I want to use something called an, an acceleration structure to help me very efficiently process what's left after I throw away, after I do this culling and things. And there's lots of different structures that exist. So is everybody okay? It's 1130. So everybody okay? Good. Uh, team drink. Take a sip. So there are many, many structures that exist that have been, again, put forth at mainly at SIGGRAPH um, uh, for dealing with, and this is like since the 70s and 1970s and 80s, people have been trying, people have had limited hardware for forever. So these are, um, have been developed for a very long period of time. People have won significant awards for, for publishing these papers that are now kind of commonplace. Um, and so there are many structures that exist and that really depends on different things like the scene, the type of scene you're trying to render and uh, how many objects you're trying to render, the, the um, uh, other properties of the objects. And so we can talk about when certain structures would be better than other structures. So for example, one example that's used a lot is, let's say you're, you're trying to render um, a rugby stadium. So you're sitting in the stands of the rugby stadium and you have all of these people you have a big empty space between the stands that you're sitting in and the people on the other side of the stands. There's lots of empty space in the middle. And then there's a field which is relatively empty except for the players on the field. Um, and rendering this is, um, is really hard because the complexity is not evenly distributed. You have a bunch of complex things here. You have a big open space and then you have lots of complex things there and you don't need a lot of, um, detail for things across the way because you just don't see a lot of the detail. So um, imagine you had a, one object um, in the middle of the field that you needed a really high resolution or really high quality thing. Um, you, this, this kind of non-uniform complexity is, is I guess what I'm getting at is, is an important thing to think about, which is very different than if you're in an indoor scene that's a room 
and really everything can be of high detail. So these different types of environments, indoor environments versus outdoor environments, um, human built environments like a city versus um, something like um, a forest or a desert. Um, each of these kind of will be better suited for different things you're doing. Highly dynamic environments versus very static environments. These are, um, again, these are kind of ways you would choose these things. Um, so the two main approaches are what are called uh, geometry partitioning, which is used uses things like bounding boxes and and other bounding um, uh, bounding volumes. Um, that's one way to do it, is to think about partitioning the geometry somehow, and another way is to think about partition partitioning the space. Um, and we're going to go through both of these um, in some detail. So geometry partitioning um, starts with objects. To think that well, I only have five objects. Let me just um, deal with those, or I can take the space and I can divide the space in um, cubes, let's say, and then I'm going to process um, the whole space and then kind of represent those objects in there. And these, all of these things can lead to extremely good speed up um, in terms of processing things. Um, um, in space partitioning, we have things like, if you could imagine a room and dividing up the room, let's say every half a meter, you're gonna, ha you're gonna have a division and then every half meter going up and every half meter going back. So you have these half meter, half meter, half meter cubes that are representing the whole room. And then an object is somewhere intersecting some of those cubes in the room. And then you process that big, um, three-dimensional space in terms of figuring out um, where things are. That wasn't a great definition, but that's okay. Uh, we'll come back to it. Um, okay, so if we think about these um, acceleration structures, these hierarchical bounding structures are, are what's used a lot. Um, and so what you can do is if you think about, um, uh, let me use this one as my prop. So I have a mug, okay, and then there's an inside and an outside of the mug. And if I have a mug and I have a pen, and I want to see if these two things intersect with each other, then what I would probably do from a hierarchical bounding volume point of view is I would take this and I would encase it. So this is a very, this is very hard for me to do intersection testing against. Um, so to figure out whether something hits something else mathematically, you can solve an equation. And so what I want to be able to do is to have a very simple equation for this. So I have an approximation, let's say a cylinder. It's very easy to do intersection testing between cylinders. And so I can, I can take this and I can encase it in a cylinder. And if the pen, which is also a cylinder, is intersecting, is not intersecting the cylinder of the cup, then they are not intersecting each other. If the pen is intersecting the cylinder around the cup, then potentially it's actually intersecting the cup itself, but it might not be. So for example, if the pen is inside the cup, it's not actually touching the cup yet, but it has penetrated this cylinder that I've wrapped around this, this cup. So if it's not, the short answer, if it's not intersecting the cylinder, it's definitely not intersecting the cup. And if it's intersecting the cylinder, it might be intersecting the cup. And if it is intersecting that cylinder, I need to recurse or I need to go down and I need to do a lower level um, collision or, or intersection test between the pen and the actual geometry of the cup. Okay, so that's it's a little bit simplified, but the idea is if I can wrap all of my objects with very simple geometry, then I can do collision tests between all of these objects at a very high level. And if there's no intersection with the higher level, there's no intersection at the lower level because these structures completely encompass the object. Okay, so what that allows me to do is to simplify the number of calculations I have to do. Whereas if I had the, the, the complete geometry of this with all of the small geometry here and all the small geometry here, I would be constantly doing way too many intersection tests. And so I can do that in a hierarchical way. And it's not just for collisions, but it's also for visibility. Because if you think about me wondering whether I can see this cup, if I can't see the bounding volume, if I can't see the cylinder, then I can't see any of the cup. Then if I can see the bounding volume, then I might be able to see the cup. So it's not just for collisions. I hope that's okay. Resources, good. 
uh, Andy's um, posting lots of great stuff. Um, so you test the parent. If the parent is visible, um, uh, if you test the parent visible, if not, then none of the children are going to be visible. So um, none of the things that are contained in it. Um, and if it is, then you recursively go down and you check the children, um, which sounds like a horror movie. But um, so you could use about you could use this information to really optimize what you're doing. So many interior levels of buildings and things really kind of work well in this kind of collision detection or or um, or view management um, approach. Um, so you don't need to solve kind of the the very particular general um, geometry intersection problems. You can really um, uh, just solve, um, just use the general one and not a specific one. So one of the things that you need to think about with this is how to wrap, what shapes should we use to wrap the objects? And there's, a, again, a lot of research on this. Um, and one is to think about um, bounding structures such as boxes. So if we think about this object, it's very clear that wrapping this in some sort of box is um, it would be really efficient because there'll be no empty space, right? I would have, I would have a um, a really tight. If if it's inter if it's intersecting the box, it's definitely going to be intersecting the geometry, and so um, it it gets me to a a, um, a solution much quicker. If I take this pen and I put it in a box, there's going to be lots of space around the pen. Um, that's not um, that's not encompassed. So what I want to do is I want to try and find the right structures. If I have a person, for example, and I want to do collision testing against a person, if I put the person in a box, then there's going to be lots of empty space around the head because it's a box. Um, and the reason we choose boxes in general is because the intersection testing with boxes is very efficient. You basically have six planes, and it's very, very easy mathematically to do collision detection with that. The other thing that's even easier is spheres. So often what we'll do is we'll put things inside a sphere because if you have, let's say, two spheres, you can very easily do um, collision detection if you know the radius of the spheres. As long as the two points are, are further away than the radius, the sum of the radii of the two spheres, there's no way that they're intersecting, right? So it's very easy to just do a distance calculation between two points and figure out whether two bounding spheres are, are are intersecting. But if I have to put a sphere around a pen, which is long and thin, um, I'm going to have a really big sphere, which means I'm going to have a lot of false um, uh, false positives in terms of my intersection calculations. OK, so if we think about um, bounding boxes, because they're, um, they're used a lot, um, there are a, a bunch of different flavors of this. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to um, skip them, but, but they're chosen based on um, the computational efficiency. Um, so I'll just leave those for you guys to look up if you want to. Another, another thing you can do is to um, use what's called a KDOP. And this is um, uh, uh, basically, if you take a sphere, I'm, I'm sorry, if you take a cube, and then you say, that's, that's six sides. If I take the opposite corners of a cube and I slice them, and move it in, I can get a tighter fit around something. And if I do that for each of the corners of the cube, I can actually get kind of a, um, a dodecahedron or something that's not a cube, but still allows me to pretty efficiently um, compute um, intersection. And it'll be a tighter fit around the object, but I'll leave that anyway. The generalization of this is called a bound bounding volume hierarchy. So a capsule or a sphere or a box, in general, my algorithm can be exactly the same if I have this structure, this data structure. I can use an algorithm that walks through and just calls whatever the collision detection or visibility detection code is for that particular bounding structure, um, bounding volume. Okay, so that's object partitioning for now. Um, another approach is this, this notion of, okay, team drink. Another structure, another way to think about it is again, as I said, this space partitioning. So I can go through and I can regularly divide up any space into a regular grid. And um, all of the, the grids uh, units, all the cells are equal sizes. Um, or I can use, uh, so the, the, the problem with that is I'm gonna have a lot of empty cells, probably. So in a room, 
you have a bed, a desk, and some things that are mainly on the floor. And then you have lots of space um, until you get to the ceiling and the walls. And so you're going to have lots of empty cells. So that might not be very efficient to have, again, your data structure is going to have one element for each cell. And a lot of them are going to be empty. So it doesn't seem very efficient. So the notion of quad trees or oct trees was, uh, was devised. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, BSPs or ba uh, binary space partitioning trees are also a way to do this, or KD trees, and we'll talk about these. Um, again, these are trying to be more efficient ways than dividing up, uh, dividing up things in a regular grid. Um, so I talked, I already talked about this a little bit um, ahead, uh, ahead of time. So um, we'll go um, kind of. These are the examples that I was um, meaning to show. So you have two objects here, and in both cases, you have a, a bounding box that's surrounding them. Uh, the one object on the left is, a, is kind of a good fit. So you, so you have a, a lot of uh, not, not very much empty space, whereas um, for the one on the right is not the best fit because um, the, the bounding box is, um, this is, in case is an is a, um, access aligned bounding box. There's lots of empty space around, um, around, the, um, around the object. Um, anyway. And uh, the nice thing about doing this in a hierarchical fashion is then, again, we can kind of reduce the number of intersection tests between this object and every other object. I only need to do this with everybody else. So it ends up being um, uh, kind of a linear um, uh, cost in terms of comparisons. Um, and that, that linear is relatively small because I have this hierarchy. Um, if I use a tree structure, then I can I can reduce it even more, um, and so I I can get to uh, O of, of log n um, complexity. So my number of comparisons is going to drop greatly because I have this hierarchical nature, and and this a big O notation is from um, computer science and and allows us to describe um, the cost or efficiency of things without talking about real numbers, because. You know, if you have 10 things to compare or a billion things to compare, um, one is going to take longer than the other, but the complexity of it is actually the same. That's, that's kind of an important thing in terms of scalability. Um, and so, um, again, object collisions, if you have two objects, you're going to have this, um, you're going to have this hierarchy and you're going to be comparing at a very high level, um, all of the, the highest level objects. So you'll have, um, so next to me, I have a big um, bookshelf, and I'm not going to compare. If I'm trying to figure out whether this pen intersects with the the, the books on the bookshelf, um, since all the books are contained in the um, bounding volume for the bookshelf, I don't need to compare the pen to see whether it intersects any of the books. I just need to say, hey, does this pen intersect the bookshelf bounding volume? And if it doesn't, I don't need to worry about the books. And if it does, then maybe each shelf has its own bounding volume. And then say, well, I don't need to look at the books for the shelves that it doesn't um, intersect with. So again, what you're doing is you're kind of removing these, the number of things that you need to look at. And so this really, um, really improves efficiency tremendously. So um, spatial subdivision, so, so bounding volumes really work on objects and they recursively look at objects. So you can compare every object, every high level bounding structure with every other one. And, um, and that's really good um, if you have, let's say a small number of objects um, and uh, uh, yeah, and a small number of objects in a, let's say a confined space. Another way to think of it is, is dividing up the space. And so for each segment of the space, whether that's a cube or whatever, you keep a list of which objects are currently in that space. So if the bookshelf is over here and there's part of the, this grid that's gonna say that's full of bookshelf and I have another one that's full of pen. And I know if, if the, the grid cells that have the pen in it are not the same as the grid cells that have the bookshelf in it, there is no way they can be touching each other. So then as the pen is moving through space, I just keep track of which grid cells it's in. And as long as it never hits a grid cell where the bookshelf is, I'm, I never have to worry about um, doing any intersection testing with it. So it's not 
it's not keeping track of the objects and how they how they change, but it is keeping track of where they are in the space. Okay, as opposed to saying uh, object to object, it's saying I'm within the space. And so the reason that the, the the nuance here is that there are really good algorithms for testing in a space where objects are and and um, and so there's there's lots of very efficient ways for processing regular grids and things like this. Um, and so there are different techniques, these um, regular grids or, or octree. So, so for example, um, this is a 2D version. So let's say there are a bunch of these um, hexagons um, and I can, I can take my, my blue space and I can divide it into um, along the X and Y axes and say, for example, that this hexagon is at least a bit overlapping with these four grid cells. And this hexagon is overlapping with these four grid cells. Since these cells, since there's no commonality between these grid cells and these ones, there's no way these can be touching. Um, from a viewing point of view, again, there's very efficient ways for me to calculate. If let's say a viewer is standing here and they're looking at the scene, I can, I can draw a ray that goes through this grid cell and this grid cell and this grid cell. And if there's no object in that grid cell, I don't need to, there's nothing that's gonna block my visibility. So for example, I can calculate that this one is in front of this one from my point of view. And I can use that to my advantage to say, okay, I actually don't need to continue drawing this ray anymore because let's say I'm trying to figure out what color I want to draw. Um, once I reach this, as long as it's not a transparent object, I can stop drawing this ray to figure out what color I want to draw something. So this visibility calculation, again, can, I, can, I can split up the scene to figure out what, what is it that, um, that, I'm do, that I can see. And this ray calculation of how it moves through a grid is extremely efficient mathematically. So that's why it's very attractive. Um, but when the world, so this is a very homogeneous scene, when the world is not very homogeneous, so, so not very regular, um, it, um, it, these, this doesn't work very well again because I have lots of empty spaces. And so, and the other question is how, how fine do I make my grid? If I make my grid too small, then um, I'm gonna have too many surfaces in each cell. Um, if the grid is too large, I'm gonna have many, 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 many cells. So if I have lots of little, um, cells that I need to go through, it's going to cost me a lot to, to mar kind of march through each one of those cells. Um, and so using some sort of non-uniform spatial subdivision, that's a, a big term, but it basically means not using a regular grid, but using an irregular way of uh, splitting things up is good. So quad trees are a really nice and elegant representation for this. So a quad tree, um, instead of uh, uniformly dividing the space, it says, okay, I'm going to have a hierarchy. So I'm gonna divide the space in these big units here. And then I'm gonna look inside each one of the units and say, hey, are there any objects in there? Oh, look, there are no objects. So I'm not gonna subdivide this one anymore. I'm gonna look here and say, oh, are there any objects here? It's like, ah, oh, there are no objects here. Okay, I'm not gonna subdivide that anymore. I look here and I say, are there any, ob yeah, there's one object. I say, okay, that's fine. One object is okay. It's then gonna look at this big square here and say, are there any objects? I'm gonna say, oh yeah, there's lots of objects. And then it's gonna subdivide that uh, by in half. So it's gonna subdivide it. And then it's gonna say, okay, now I have these smaller four grid cells. It's gonna look at this one and say, okay, I only have one object, so I'm not gonna subdivide that one. I have no objects here. I'm not gonna subdivide that one. I have two objects here. Okay, I'm gonna subdivide. And it goes through and it splits that in half. And so it gets to a point where either you get to some level that you say, okay, I'm gonna stop, or you get to a level where there's only one, either one or no object in each cell. And so what I can do is I can represent this as a data structure, as a tree. And a tree, the parent has four children, and the, the, the first child has no children, the second child has no children, the third child has no children, the fourth child has four children, one, two, three, four, and the, the first of those four children doesn't have any children. The second of those four, four children has four children. And so you can build this tree. And then I can use an algorithm to walk through this tree to very efficiently do some calculation. It's okay so far. I'm at 50, so um, still a bunch of stuff to show, but we'll see how we go. Um,
So this is a, a quad tree in that it's a two dimensional thing. And an oct tree is a generalization. And um, now what we do, instead of just having two dimensions, we, we split this into, into cubes. So we can split into eight equal size cubes and, um, and, then, and then walk through it in a very similar way. And you can see that this is a, I will, I will not have as many, um, not have as many grid cells to check here as I would if I were to divide this up in a regular grid, let's say of this, of this size. Okay. Um, so we can, uh, we can kind of think about um, each one of these uh, types of things and, and the, the, the trade-offs of when one is better, when one is better. So grids are very easy to implement. They require a lot of memory um, for non-uniform uh, non scenes. They're maybe not good choices. Octrees are better uh, for most C's, uh, scenes. Um, you can use nested grids, which is kind of a, a similar to an octree. Um, you can do some spatial subdivision, um, and I won't go into too much, or you can use this notion of hierarchical bounding volumes. Um, you could actually use a regular grid, and then the representation within the grid cells is a hierarchical bounding volume. So you can actually combine these together. Um, uh, so a KD tree is similar to an OC tree, but instead of splitting in the middle, you choose one, uh, you choose a place to split that makes more sense. So for example, in this, if I had like one object or two objects over here, I might, instead of splitting in the middle, I'll split a little bit further. So, so an oct tree would split here. Instead of doing that, I'm actually going to split here so that I have um, larger um, empty spaces that are grouped together, right? So in the previous example, um, I might actually have in a KD tree, I wouldn't actually have two children here. I would only have... Um, one child because all of this is a is a uniformly empty space, so that's um, that's a KD tree, and BSP trees. I'm not going to go into too much, um, but KD trees are actually really um, really interesting and very efficient. Um, and I have a link to something there. So um, lastly, I want to talk about cell portal visibility because this is used a lot as well, and this is a really nice technique um, for um, for static scenes. So what I didn't talk talk much about before um, is um, each of these, so the spatial subdivision and bounding volume hierarchies are a way to represent the scene. Um, and they can be used for static scenes or dynamic scenes. So there's a cost to creating the data structure, whether it's a um, spatial subdivision like a grid or object hierarchy. And then there's another cost for updating it. So let's say an object moves, or let's say um, a wall gets blown up and suddenly I have a bunch of new objects. So there's a cost. So when you're looking at deciding what to do, there's a cost for the representation and then there's a cost for updating it. How much does it cost to remove an object? Let's say something blows up and I, can I wanna remove it from my structure. In the grid sense, I'd have to go through and figure out, okay, for this object, which cells were, was it in? And I need to then remove it. Um, and for bound, bounding volume hierarchies, I can just remove it from the scene, uh, from my list of objects, and then it's gone. So there's a different cost in updating each one of those. Um, in cell uh, portal visibility, um, what we wanna do here is, given somebody is in a space, we wanna track where they are and then somehow figure out what they can possibly see from that location. And there's different ways to do this. And one is, uh, is cell-based and the other is kind of point-based and we can, uh, they're both used uh, typically together. Um, uh, but um, anyway, so I'll go through an example and see like, like when you would do these. So in the point-based algorithms, um, you have a point so let's say you're in, in a room, I mean, in a building, and you want to figure out, okay, from this uh, point in this building, what can I see? And then um, as the person moves around, like walking through a dungeon or something like that, the, what they can see is going to change. So for example, they come out of a doorway, and suddenly there's a whole new room, or they go around a corner and there's a whole bunch of new stuff they can see, or a monster or whatever. Um, and so kind of figuring out how often I need to recompute what I can see is a question that's left um, depending on the scene and depending on what you're trying to do um, and, your, and your computational budget. 
Um, but a lot of this you could pre-compute, which is great. So what you want to do is you want to come up for each for each location in a in a space is you want to figure out is what objects are potentially visible. So they're not they may or may not be visible, but there are some objects that are definitely not visible because they're on the other side of the world or they're they're, they're five rooms away and there's absolutely no way for me to see them. So from my particular room or my particular location, these are not potentially visible. So I can go through and pre-compute what is potentially visible from my location. And then at runtime, when I say, what should I draw? I can say, well, here's my list of everything that's potentially visible. Let me process those to figure out whether they're actually visible. And so um, there's this pre-computation pre that I can do to figure out whether something's going to be visible, but then th when I to, to do the actual calculation to figure out, figure out whether they're really visible, I only need to look at those objects. So one way to think about this is let's say I have this top-down view of this space. So I have a bunch of rooms and um, so and they're all uh, they all have letters and what I want to do is let's say I, I'm in I'm currently in I, I, I have this pre-processing step and I say, okay, I want to figure out if somebody is in I, what things are potentially visible? So which spaces are potentially visible? So I can use what's called stabbing lines to, to let's say, okay, when I'm in this room, I can draw a ray from this room to other rooms and figure out what other rooms are visible. So it's very clear from I, if I look out through the right-hand doorway, um, I'm definitely going to be able to see J. And through J, I can probably see H from some locations in I. So potentially I could see some things in H. So I need to add both J and H. I can't, there's no way for me to draw a line from I going through this doorway from H to G. So I wouldn't even, sorry, I wouldn't even um, consider G. There's another doorway in I. And so I, I send a stabbing line that goes from I and I can see uh, B is visible and E is visible. Again, all of these are aligned on planes of things in the room. Um, and potentially I could just see a little bit of C, right? Because there's a little bit of a grazing thing that allows me to see C. So what I would do is in a pre-computation step when I'm building my environment, I would say, hey, build me um, a potentially visible set for each of my rooms. So for I, the potentially visible set would be B, C, E, F, J, B, C, E, F, H, and J. So that at runtime, I would say, hey, you, game engine, the person is currently an I, and here's all the stuff that they might be able to see. Now, there are things, for instance, there might be an object here in J that the user, the user, the player just can't see. But we don't know that until we actually start um, working at runtime. What we're trying to do again is, is make it so that like G could have a lot of complex things. A could have a lot of complex things in them. And I just don't even have to think about them because they're not potentially visible. So that's, um, that's the first thing. Then what I can do, um, this is now at runtime, I have, um, so this is a point-based system. At runtime, this is me and I'm looking through this space. Here's my room. And so what I can do is I can actually say, okay, I'm going to, um, figure out that in the current, my current view frustum hits this point, these things in this room. And then if, uh, and so all of that is going to be visible. Everything in there is going to be visible because there's nothing occluded. Um, I can go the next level and say, well, through this area, I can, uh, I know that I can't see things here. So potentially I have this stuff that's also visible. And then I can recurse down and say, well, there's a portal here. So I can see through this portal into this room and then, then through that portal into this room. And so I have this area that's now visible to me. Um, and then I'm gonna have a little bit here and then, um, and then a little bit here. So this point-based approach um, at runtime will do a lookup of the space that I'm in. And this is why um, rectilinear or things with right angle spaces are so attractive to graphics, so the original Doom only had um, this kind of, um, these kinds of spaces because the calculations are really, really easy when I'm trying to do this. Um, and so I, I can know like at, at a certain time what's potentially visible. And so what I will do is um, um, do these calculations to do that, uh, to figure that out. So um, I just got a couple more slides and I'm done. So three more slides. Sorry, I'm running a little bit long. 
So if we think about how to put all this together, the best solution is going to be some combination of processing things, um, static, um, a static representation is, uh, static rep representations will really get me a long way, probably 99% of everything that's in a, in a game or whatever is going to be static. Um, and I know that's changing, but um, again, especially back in the day, um, a lot of things were non-interactable. So when you were running around, you couldn't blow anything up. There were certain things you could blow up because the other things were completely static. Um, so the best solution is going to be some combination depending on what, what you're trying to build. And so it'll be a balance between this pre-computation computation and then runtime computation. Um, and in general, what you want to do is you want to try and reuse as much as you can. So it's like ray tracing you can use for intersections, collision detection, visibility calculations. So all of these data structures that I'm talking about can be used for all of these things because you can figure out from a behavioral animation point of view, what potential characters could I interact with? Or if a bird is flying around, what can it potentially run into. So all of the structures that are represented here are really, really good because you can use them for a lot of things that you might want to do in the types of interactive environments that we're running. So that's it.